We're really excited to have everyone tonight and thank you for joining for our online presentation. Since it is 704, I think it's ready time for us to get started. So hello everyone, my name is Linda Grant. I'm with the City of Milpitas and along with Lauren from the City of Sunnyvale, we're going to be hosting this webinar tonight. Along with our co-sponsor Bosca and our instructor Loretta O'Brien, we are super excited to teach you guys about water efficient organic edible gardening. First of all, I'm going to go over some rules of how we can make this webinar work for all, everyone and how you can ask questions during the class. So all attendees are muted by default and the instructor will pause periodically for questions. There are two ways that you can ask your question. During the actual class, we ask you to write in the Q&A questions and then uh, me and Lauren will read those to Loretta. When the class is over, um, the slides have finished, Loretta's gonna hang around to answer Q&A and at that point, you can raise your hand um, Laura, if you want to click, it'll show you where that button is at the bottom of your screen. And then um, I will unmute you and you can ask Loretta your question directly. Um, but as I said, that would happen at the, towards the Q&A at the end, but throughout the class, please type in questions at any time. I'd also like to note that this webinar is being recorded and will be made available on the Bosco website. And if you go to the Bosco website, there's actually a library of all the past online classes we've had over the past couple of months. So please check it that out as well. First, I would like to share a little background on Bosco's landscape education program. Bosca is a special district that represents the interests of 26 cities, water districts, and private water companies, all of which purchase wholesale water from SFPUC. Bosca member agencies collectively serve over 1.8 million residents and 40,000 businesses in San Mateo, Santa Clara, and Alameda counties. Bosca's goal is to ensure a reliability supply of high quality water at a fair price for our agencies and their customers. Consistent with that goal, Bosca provides a regional water conservation program to support our agencies in improving water use efficiency. The landscape education program, which is hosting this class today, is an element of that conservation program. While we have made significant strides in water use efficiency, outdoor water use still represents the single largest untapped opportunity for water conservation in the Bosca service area. Outdoor water use reduction through the use of drought tolerant plants, innovative techniques to conserve water, updates to irrigation systems can ensure that future water supplies of our communities are met. Next. Now I wanna go over a few highlights on conservation programs that may be of interest to you to help you um, save water at home. So specifically, if you live in the city of Milpitas, we work with Santa Clara Valley Water District on a landscape rebate program. This includes rebates of $2 per square foot of replacing your lawn with drought tolerant plants um, and irrigation equipment upgrades. We also offer rainwater capture rebates. We also want to let you know about our the Valley Waters WaterWise Indoor Survey Kit. This is a great activity to do while you're at home with your kids. You can look and try to find leaks from your sinks and your toilets and make sure that you're not wasting any water. If you want to learn more about these rebate programs in Milpitas, please go to SaveWaterMilpitas.org. Next. <laughs> And now I'll let Lauren talk about um, how you can save water in Sunnyville. Great, thank you so much, Linda. So the city of Sunnyville also has the same rebate program through Santa Clara Valley Water District, and it gives homeowners and commercial industrial institutional property owners 
a rebate for replacing lawns and plants that require a lot of water with drought tolerant plants and permeable hardscape. This is a $1 per square foot rebate. Uh, Sunnyville residents are also eligible for a rebate through Santa Clara Valley District Water District for properties that connect closed washers to a gray water irrigation system. This is up to $200. Uh, you can learn more about Sunnyvale specific rebates at the link below. And I also want to call out if anyone's looking for compost, compost is available for Sunnyvale residents at the Smart Station. Stop by Monday through Saturday from 8 a.m. to 5 p.m. with your own mask, shovel, and container. And this is free, so it's a great option. Great, and if you don't live in Sunnyvale or Milpitas and you're our BOSCA agency, BOSCA works with their agencies to offer similar rebates. So BOSCA has a Lawn Be Gone program, which offers rebates of a one to four dollars per square foot of lawn replace, which is a um, and then Alaska also has rain barrel rebates of up to one hundred dollars for um, collecting water in rain barrels. A new addition for Bosca is the Smart Controller Program which provides instant rebates and heavily discounted pricing on purchase of the Ratio 3 irrigation controller. This controller can be operated on your smartphone and normally retails for $280. Through this program, customers of participating water agencies can purchase a controller for $100 plus tax. Last but oh, that last but not least, Bosca has a redesigned landscape rebate program, which is scheduled to launch July 1st. The program will incorporate the current landscape rebate and rain barrel rebates in addition to incentives for stormwater retention features. For more information, and if you want to find out if your agency um, per, is partnering with Bosca for these programs, please go to bayareaconservation.org and check your agency's website. And then if you enjoy tonight's program, we invite you to join some of our additional upcoming webinar classes. You can view the full schedule at bayareaconservation.org. But as you can see, there's some really good, interesting classes coming up and more will, will be added. So if you are looking for additional resources on water efficient landscaping, please visit bayareagardening.org, um, our WaterWise Gardening website. So this site will help support you in choosing plants, resources, and help you on your journey to do drought tolerant edible plants that we will learn about tonight. <laughs> so on that note, I want to introduce our instructor, Lo Loretta O'Brien. So Loretta has been an avid gardener for most of her life, having grown up with annual backyard vegetable gardens. She is the co-founder and garden manager of Pacifica Gardens, a community-run urban farm on the San Mateo coast. Her training includes permaculture design and biointensive mini farming. Loretta, thank you so much for joining us tonight and I'll, I'll let you take it from here. Okay, great, thank you so much. Uh, first things first, let's uh, switch here. And share another screen. And okay, this is the same problem I had before. Well, welcome everybody. Uh, sorry for the little technology glitch there. I'm obviously new to Zoom teaching. Um, I just want to thank everybody for taking the time this evening um, through in while we're experiencing so much turmoil in our country and um, to learn about um, uh, backyard gardening. Appreciate it very, very much. 
the intention of this class is uh, to, as an introduction to WaterWise back, um, backyard food growing. Um, I'm assuming that most people are fairly new to growing edibles in their yard. However, I'm, I'm, I don't know who you are, so you might have some very, very experienced gardeners uh, that will um, uh, offer all, all different kinds of uh, um, um, help along the way. So with that, we'll, we'll get going. Um, as uh, Linda um, mentioned, I am the designer and co-founder and garden manager of Pacifica Gardens. Pacifica Gardens, that, that, which is my virtual screen right now, is a, a lawn conversion, a giant lawn conversion. It's actually a soccer field, and we started it uh, 12 years ago. And we've, it's about 30,000 square feet, and we've been growing fruits and vegetables for the benefit of our local uh, food bank uh, for the past 12 years. So it's been, um, it's, a, it's a great project. If you get a chance, um, you know, please go look at our website. We want to talk about just some basic components of water-wise gardening, and I just just distilled it into these five points, and hopefully we'll be able to touch to some capacity on each of these issues that would be beneficial for all of you. We want to talk a little bit about the garden plan when we're when we're planning our edible garden. A little bit of different requirements than say an ornamental garden. In order, to, we want to elim, uh, uh, obviously minimize our water use. We want to talk about soil improvement because soil, soil improvement and creating living soil will also help with our water-wise management. So we have some planting methods that we can discuss that will minimize water use. And we'll talk a little bit about effective and efficient watering. Um, and then lastly, I wanna talk a little bit about protecting the soil throughout the year because protecting your soil is very, very important for water conservation and then also maintaining the uh, the living soil that you've created throughout the season. Let's talk a little bit about our garden plan. Things you want to consider with, for your plan, your garden size, the location of your garden beds. Obviously, you want to take a look at the hours of sunlight you have, when a, you know, what areas of your garden are going to be prone to shade. Are there aspects of your garden that are going to be a windy? Um, and then also to the urban wildlife, the things, the four-legged little things and the winged things that like to come and visit in the garden. You have to take all of those into consideration. We want to talk about the types of garden beds that we can have for growing our edibles. A little bit about the size, the optimal uh, bed size, and then the idea of creating a watering plan. When we're first beginning to grow edibles, I always like to encourage people to start small. I remember making this, state, this mistake multiple times when I was planning my, when I was building my own gardens in my own backyard. Um, we wanna set ourselves up for success. If we start too large and it becomes unwieldy and we start having problems, we get discouraged. And I often say, you know, maybe you just wanna start with one or two beds. All right, and if you don't have a lot of garden, a backyard garden spare some barrels, you can expand your, um, your garden as you, um, um, as you have success and begin developing some confidence. One thing that we wanna take a look at is hours of sunlight. Right now we're headed into the, we have the longest days. Um, the solstice is uh, coming in a few weeks. Uh, so we have a lot of sun. But as we go into the fall, we want to take into consideration the days are going to get shorter. So when we're choosing a site for our garden, we want to make sure that we find a sunny location, obviously. <laughs> um, and it's best to have a, a site picked out for our garden that, that gives us at least eight hours um, of sunlight or unshaded area uh, for, about, not for, about eight, for about eight hours during the, our main growing season. Certain crops like leaf crops don't need as much uh, sunlight, but our root crops are gonna need a little bit more, okay? And if possible, the best thing to use is, is choose a southwest location for your vegetable garden. We know that not, that's not always possible, but if you can do that, that would be our best location. Things we wanna consider, wind. Wind um, can be really hard on vegetable gardens and they also cause a lot of water evaporation. So when you're choosing, if you have a choice, um, um, try to find a place in your garden that has minimal wind exposure. And if you need to, you may have to um, create wind screens. 
urban wildlife is always, um, or not always, but can often be a, a, a challenge. Deer, obviously, um, that can come into your gardens. And those are the things that we need to take into consideration. Um, I have had to, in the past, fence my garden from my dogs because they're great gardeners. And uh, I have friends um, and family members who have chickens and goats as well. So we wanna make sure that, again, we're setting ourselves up for success here and nothing is more frustrating than to have um, uh, other people or other animals come and eat our, our, uh, the fruits of our, our labors. We have lots of choices for different types of garden beds when we're talking about edibles. Three main things I'm gonna talk about are raised beds, the in-ground beds, and then containers. Raised beds allow easy access for the gardener. Okay, so we have the ability to create the optimal soil texture. When you raise a bed, you're gonna fill it and you're gonna fill it with soil. So you have an option there to fill it with the best soil that you can possibly find. With our raised beds, I always, raise beds are gonna be open on the bottom and they're gonna be set on the soil. Right, so if you, you can even just set them on your lawn if you're doing a lawn conversion, if you want. Um, but I would recommend that we add something called gopher wire, or actually it's one half inch galvanized hardware cloth uh, is, is the best option for that. Raised beds uh, are often uh, easier to install um, uh, drip irrigation. So if you're gonna go with a drip irrigation system, um, the raised beds allow for that. In-ground in beds are the more traditional type of digging into the ground. Uh, these are great um, bed, um, uh, garden beds. Um, and actually, um, I, uh, the Pacifica Gardens was, was primarily an in, um, in-ground in bed, right? dug in bed for a very long time. The advantages of these beds are the root systems are gonna have full access to the soil. Sometimes with our raised beds or our pots, we end up kind of the, the small area that um, we don't, uh, the root systems don't have full access. In ground dug in beds are inexpensive, they are long lasting, and they're very easy to integrate with ornamental garden design. And which is, and they don't have to be square, they don't have to be rectangular, uh, they can be sort of curved, they can encompass and uh, your entire or ornamental area as well. So you can have a combination of both ornamentals and edibles. And your crops can wander. Uh, for instance, pumpkins are, and squashes, they can wander. So the, there's an advantage to planting into the ground. There are some disadvantages as well. On the coast side here, gophers are a problem. And unless you're willing to lose a lot of your crop, uh, we, we actually recommend a, a raised bed for, uh, for our gardeners. Container gardening is an interesting uh, way. It's a, it's a great way for people who have uh, small spaces, who can only garden on decks. Um, they allow for more physical accessibility uh, for the gardener. Obviously easy to, con to control gophers and moles. And um, the containers and the small beds, we need to have them placed on a non-porous uh, surface, okay? Um, uh, containers, unfortunately, are less water efficient. And I always recommend that we use, if we can, the clay pots or even wooden planters because they're gonna hold water better. The thin plastic pots, very often they'll, they'll dry out very quickly and require um, multiple waterings per day. But container gardening for um, people who don't have a lot of mobility or don't have a lot of space is a great option for us who want to grow food in our, in our, in our own backyards. If you have a choice, if you're building beds, I'd like to talk about the optimal Right, so minimum standards, so to speak, of our, of our garden beds. Three by three, three foot by three foot seems to be optimal for the plant synergy. If we get it too, too small, uh, the plants don't have enough, um, enough room. Um, helps with the garden versatility and water conservation. Right, so if, you're, if you are planning to build beds, this is a great opportunity for you to build them the way you want them. Um, I'd like to suggest that build, uh, beds that are wider than four feet uh, tend to be difficult to work in and um, whether they're dug in or whether they're raised. 
Okay, so uh, take your own body into consideration when you're building your raised beds. Uh, smaller beds, if you only have, if you already have build, uh, beds built and they're smaller than that, obviously use them. Um, you might not be able to grow larger crops like pumpkins or big um, squashes, uh, but you can certainly use those smaller beds for leaf crops and, and smaller plants and definitely um, herbs. Path space. Path space is always an interesting uh, conversation. Uh, gardeners have, um, you know, um, lots of different uh, views about path space. Um, paths need to have enough room for you to work. Um, sometimes when we're optimizing there are our growing space, we tend to make our path space too narrow. I've had that experience in my own yard and I, um, and in my, in my new beds, I've actually widened it so I can actually work in there. Path spaces should be porous and I'm, um, I'm sure that most of us know this, um, path space should be porous. You can have a living path space with a, a, a ground cover. You can use stepping stones, you can gravel, or you can use wood chips if, if you, to, to create a permanent path space. Uh, porous path space are gonna prevent water runoff, okay, and allow the rainwater to soak into, into the aquifer. Please don't concrete your path spaces. And I, um, I often cite an example years ago, I was invited to a school garden here on the coast side and only to discover that they had built the garden and then concreted the spaces between the garden beds. And while it was neat and tidy and there was very little soil that came into the classrooms, it actually became, it was, it was a, a definitely an issue for water runoff and this one thing that we do not want to do. One of the things you wanna consider with your path space is are you going to bring a wheelbarrow into it? Um, a narrow path space where it's just wide enough for the gardener and maybe a few tools can be one foot, two foot. Um, if you want a, um, to be able to bring your wheelbarrow through, you're gonna have to have a path space that is probably about three feet wide. Create a water plan. Before you build your garden, I highly recommend you figure out how you're gonna water it. Are you gonna be watering it by hand or do you think that you might want to install some sort of a, um, an irrigation system, preferably a drip system or perhaps even you know, soaker hoses? That's the one thing that we, you know, sometimes we, go, we get very excited about, about gardening and we forget how we're gonna water it. So for backyard gardeners, consider hand watering and drip irrigation. Either of those two I think are, are probably the best for our smaller gardens or even a combination of the two. One of the things that we've uh, done now in, in uh, Pacifica Gardens, and we have 30 raised beds that are 20, that are 20 feet by um, four feet. So that's quite a few uh, um, beds, is that we do a combination of drip irrigation and hand watering. Now I can explain later why we do that. Overhead sprinklers, uh, manual and automatic ones, are prone to water waste. Um, obviously an evaporation and watering overhead onto our plants can promote mildew and fungal growth. And this is something on the coast side that we have to deal with all the time. In Milpitas and Sunnyvale, um, in, in the sunnier climates, this is less of an issue because the climate is so warm. We have a lot of fog, and so we have to take that into consideration that we aren't really watering the leaves so much of, of the plants. Whatever you choose for your, uh, for your garden beds, um, allow freedom for your root systems to grow deep into the soil whenever possible. I, I um, you know, suggest that people avoid beds that are closed on the bottom and, and that are sitting on concrete or sitting on bricks. Um, we, in order to maximize our food growing capabilities and then also to water, uh, we'd like to have the root systems have their freedom to grow into the soil. Make sure that your beds are accessible to the gardeners that will be working in the garden. Obviously drainage is a consideration. Once you build your beds and fill them, you're going to have to take a look at the drainage there and plan for easy irrigation. Okay, and also you can be you can be creative. This picture on the right is a an herb spiral that was built from recycled um, uh, recycled concrete by an AmeriCorps team that came to Pacific Gardens in 215. This is our, our it's actually quite lovely now. It has uh, um, herbs planted in it, but you can be creative. It doesn't have 
Just remember your garden beds don't have to be square or rectilinear. Um, they can if you want to be. Let's talk a little bit about soil preparation. Okay, so soil is always an interesting topic. I'm not a soil scientist, I'll full disclosure. Um, but we do want to have a little bit of a conversation about what we call living soil. So soil that, is, uh, that has sufficient organic matter and living organisms will hold water and provide our optimal growing environment for our plants. So we want to improve the condition of our soil, right? And improving the condition of your soil is a very, very important aspect to your water-wise gardening. And of course, like we just said, we want to create soil that is living. Our best garden soil is going to be a mixture of the three uh, soil uh, three types of soil particles. Many of us are already familiar with things uh, like called sand, salt, and clay. And our our loam, if you will, uh, um, the optimal loam would be a combination of those three. A good garden soil will also have somewhere between five and ten percent organic matter. Now, 5%, or 5 to 10% organic matter, uh, it sometimes takes us a few years to, to get to, but it's definitely a goal that we want to um, have for our garden. And we want our garden soil to have living soil organisms that bind soil particles. Right? So they're going to create and maintain the pore space and feed the root systems. And our living organisms are going to be our beneficial bacteria, fungi, and our earthworms. For our in-ground beds, Right, we're going to have to examine the soil, learn what you have. I grew up in Fremont and I have a lot of experience in uh, gardening in clay. And so uh, for many, many years, my mom and I grew all kinds of things in our home garden in clay. And so that's why we became very familiar with this idea of, of working with the, with the clay soil. But Examine your soil, know what, so, what type of the soil that you have. You might want to test it, okay? And I, you know, all, I always recommend that people test for the, uh, the percentage of organic matter and then also do, do a basic nutrient content. You don't need to do this every year. Once you get a system in your garden, once you create a, a, a sound, an ecologically sound water-wise garden, these types of tests um, become less and less necessary. So for in-ground beds, we're gonna add organic compost. And initially, it'll be somewhere between perhaps a half an inch to one inch. For the raised beds, once you raise them, once you build raised beds, this is one of our garden beds that we have at Pacifica Gardens. Again, I told you they, these are uh, four feet by uh, 20 feet long. We're going to have to fill the beds. So fill the beds with purchased loam, right, on topsoil from a reliable garden supply company. So I often um, am asked, well, can I get dirt from a construction site? And uh, if so-and-so had just d dug out um, uh, some soil for a, you know, a, for whatever purpose for their landscaping, can I use that? Yes, of course you can. Um, but I always encourage people to know this, where that soil came from, what is its history, does it possibly have uh, contaminants in it and heavy metals, and if you are at all um, concerned about that, I would have it tested. I prefer to recommend and that people purchase their um, a, a good top quality um, topsoil from a reliable source. Your new raised beds will need uh, to have some soil improvement because for the most part, even though it's, it's perfect sandy loam, our loam, um, it's not going to have necessarily have the um, uh, ha have the organic matter in it that you need unless you get a mix that has already incorporated that. So you'll need to add your organic compost. And raised beds will not necessarily need to be dug, whereas our in-ground beds, we're going to very often until we get enough organic matter in there, until we actually improve that soil sufficiently will end up having to dig it, okay? So I just want to have a comment a little bit on this idea of digging and, and, and sort of no-till kind of concepts. We definitely want to move toward no-till, right? And I, um, I do 
um, not recommend people using a rototiller. I know initially it's very, very tempting, um, but rototillers actually will increase the compaction of your soil and will literally chop up the living components of your of your soil. So if you do create have an in uh, a dug in bed in the ground, um, you're probably going to have to dig that manually. With our raised beds, we're not going to have to do that very often. Right? Sometimes they do get compacted, but if you if you care for the soil once you have it, uh, you won't need to be doing a lot of digging. For the pots and the small containers, we're going to fill those pots and containers with um, uh, soil mixtures that are specifically for container gardening. So for our containers, these are my strawberries growing on my deck here on the right. Um, you can create your own container soil um, um, with some sandy loam and uh, about half sandy loam and then the other half compost. Generally, our container gardens are going to require more compost and organic fertilizer because they're, the space for the root systems are limited. And again, I want to reiterate that the, the pots and the small containers aren't as water-wise as, say, our raised beds or our dug-in beds. But we can make sure that we use water -wising, uh, watering techniques as much as possible. The last thing that we're going to do for our soil preparation is um, perhaps add some organic amendments. So organic amendments and our fertilizers are going to be the, our key components to our organic vegetable garden. Here's where you choose what you want in terms of um, amendments and fertilizers. I personally like to choose um, uh, fertilizers that are not based um, with animal products. Just it's a philosophy of my own. So for years, I've used alfalfa meal as, as a, uh, um, an additional nitrogen source as needed. I apply my amendments according to a soil test. If you don't have a soil test, then you can easily apply the fertilizer just based on uh, the, hundred, the per 100 square foot recommendation on the box. Okay. Also, I'd like to suggest that people consider using compost tea that they've made in their own yard. Um, and uh, worm casting. So if you are, and we'll talk a little bit about composting, but uh, composting in your own yard, creating uh, um, your own worm castings with a little vermiculture bin, uh, these organic fertilizers can pretty much take the place of purchased uh, fertilizers, which makes the, your garden more sustainable. We want to make sure that we protect the soil not only from a water perspective, but from a living perspective. So garden bed soil should not be exposed or left empty for too long. So at the end of your season, and we'll talk about this briefly at the end, wanna make sure that your soil is covered with something. Hopefully it's gonna be cover crop. Maybe it's an overwintered vegetable crop, okay? But we shouldn't leave beds um, completely empty and we shouldn't leave the soil exposed. Empty beds will lose moisture Okay, and when the bed dries out, the living organisms die, right? And the water saving soil structure that you've created will be damaged, okay? We use uh, cover, um, row cover uh, at the garden. So if for some reason, like we're, we're not gonna be able to plant a garden, a, a bed right away, we'll cover it with shade net. And this uh, bed on the right here, which is cabbages, uh, has a shade net over it just to, and we can see that we're, we're actually covering that, um, that bed for a few days after the transplanting to protect the soil and to protect the little seedlings. Okay, so now um, uh, we'll stop here for a couple of minutes here and, and perhaps have a couple of questions. Linda, do we have any questions? Yes, yes <laughs> we do. Um, going back to the soil test, we have a couple questions on how you can order a soil test and how you perform one. Okay, so I use a, uh, a testing company uh, that's in Southern California. There are, uh, there are uh, several of them that you can go to Peaceful Valley Farm Supply. There is a testing company there. Uh, the, um, uh, the soil testing company in Southern California that I use um, is um, if somebody actually wants the name of it, you can email me later. I'm happy to share that. Um, the soil testing is, uh, you can do it several ways. 
what you'll do is you'll take soil samples from your soil. They'll go down about six inches. You'll take up the, as the, the clean soil and put it in little packages. And then you'll fill out a form and that will ask about the types of things that you want to grow. Um, what's the history of the soil uh, and um, um, some of uh, the water, what, ha what has been grown there and, and you'll sh um, be able to ship that off to the testing company. The testing company will come back and well, the test of the soil report will give you detailed information on all of your, your basic nutrients in your, in your soil, including organic matter and recommendations uh, for amendments. So uh, if you um, are very serious about you, your soil or you feel as though maybe you have some issues, uh, getting a soil test is, I would recommend one. Great, one last question about that is um, how expensive the tests usually are, like a range? Yeah, yeah, depends on what you're testing. If you're testing for um, heavy metals, uh, th those can um, those can be a little bit more expensive. When we initially did a soil testing at, at Pacifica Gardens, we we did our basic nutrient and organic matter soil testing, which is right around one hundred and fifty dollars. And then each metal that we tested for was, I think, an additional forty or fifty dollars. So depending on what you're testing, um, it can get a little bit pricey. Um, but um, if you're just looking for um, you know your basic uh, soil texture, um, your organic matter, and the nutrients in your soil. It's not that expensive. Great. Well, we have a couple more. Um, in the beginning, you talked about gopher wire, and we have a question if chicken wire can be used instead. Excellent question. This, I get asked this all the time. Uh, no. <laughs> okay. Uh, so uh, chicken wire is usually a one inch hex uh, wire and um, that uh, doesn't last very long uh, for one. And for two, the one inch hex, it seems kind of silly, but the one inch hex is actually uh, big enough for a little baby gopher to get into. So uh, the little baby gophers can get into a one inch hex. So we recommend, we recommend the half inch 19 gauge galvanized hardware cloth. It's, it's uh, um, initially it's, it's, you know, you need tin snips and gloves and a really good stapler uh, to uh, uh, put over your beds, but it, it definitely it will last for a very, very long time. Great, we'll do just a couple more. Um, we have a question about clarifying what is double digging? Ah, got it. So, uh, excellent. Uh, double digging is a technique where you can um, uh, aerate the soil and uh, um, decompact the soil down to 24 inches. So, you can Google um, all kinds of videos. John Jevons from Ecology Action, where I learned to do uh, biointensive gardening, uh, has a great video on his website, Grow Biointensive. Um, and double digging is a process by which you will remove 12, the top 12 inches of a section of the soil, move it, and then loosen the lower 12 inches with a fork and then sort of like then move forward. It's um, once you see how you do it, you, you um, easily understand it. Um, but this is a, a terrific way to begin uh, growing in, in the ground and um, getting the, um, the compaction and uh, you know, reducing the compaction and allowing um, the air and the root systems to grow into the, into the garden. Then we have some questions about um, using fabric pots or grow bags instead of uh, plastic containers for container gardening and what you suggest. Yeah, um, I, um, I'm just new to the, to, the, uh, to the fabric pot idea myself. I, um, I'm going to be um, uh, putting some up on my upper deck um, and to, to see how, how they grow. I like that idea better than the plastic pots. My sense is that they will um, hold water or they'll, they'll not dry out as quickly um, as the plastic pots, but 
I don't really know. <laughs> so um, I experiment away. I prefer non-plastic things to grow my food in. So that's why I'm, I'm giving this, this idea a try as well. Great, uh, we'll do one more question and then we can do a couple later on. So we have a question about um, the 24 inches and we have one question that says they don't have a raised bed and if they want to plant vegetables in the ground, do they need to dig 24 inches? And then another, Raj is kind of asking a similar of like, is that kind of the standard of in ground is the 24 inches? Excellent questions. Yeah, you don't you don't have to do anything. <laughs> um, but if you if uh, double digging is um, an experience, if you watch the video, um, um, if you I can't double dig, I would strongly recommend that you get down at least uh, 12 inches. One of the things that we want to avoid is sort of turning the soil. Um, you know, with our with a shovel. There's lots of different techniques you can use. We use a fork primarily, and what we'd like to do is dig down um, uh, at least 12 inches, loosen that soil up, and you can do that in very um, systematically uh, along, uh, you know, creating creating a bed. Um, if you find that after you grow in in that um, in that garden with only digging down 12 inches that you didn't get uh, what you thought you were going to get in terms of of plant growth then you may want to consider doing double digging down the road so, great um if we didn't answer your question yet we will in a little bit but we'll let uh Lorda continue okay great all right thank you okay uh, so let's talk a little bit about compost. I am a um, uh, I am the compost crazed maniac. I think that growing compost in your uh, creating your own compost in your own yard is the is the best thing that you can do. When you're first starting, though, and if you don't have compost, then you're going to need to get compost, and and your cities are providing that for you. So take advantage of the of those opportunities. So pre, um, composting in your own backyard, I think, is the number one thing that you can do to save water. We'll talk about that in a second. Home composting reduces waste, so we're not grinding um, our uh, kitchen scraps into the um, uh, into the uh, to the sink. All right, the uh, the disposal. Um, home compost is full of beneficial organisms, bacteria, fungi, and earthworms. Very often when we purchase compost or we get compost from another location, there has been a significant amount of heat that has been applied to that. And the reason for that is that pathogens must be killed. Right? So that is definitely um, uh, something that needs to be done. But by the same token, um, the, um, all of the beneficial bacteria, fungi, and obviously earthworms will also be killed. So Compost that we get, bagged compost, uh, commercial made compost, very often will not have living organisms that are going to give us that living soil that will actually hold water better, right, than the non-living soil. So making your own compost at home, I highly recommend that. And if you can't do it this year, then maybe start next year. So the thing uh, about compost is that you can select the materials for your compost pile. So you know what's going in there. Right, so, and really it is easy once you get started. I've been composting for, oh, 40 years. And I, I've been living that way um, for a very long time. And once you get going, it's actually quite easy. So compost is just decomposed organic matter, right? It's a natural process, right, of recycling organic material, right, leaves and vegetable scraps and gardeners call it right, black gold. And most of us in my own backyard garden, I rarely uh, use other, any other amendments other than my own compost. So once you get going, this idea of how much fertilizer should I put in, how much you know, amendment should I use, um, becomes almost irrelevant because you're creating nutrient-rich soil with your home compost. Our good compost can abide our nitrogen 
right, and carbon and other nutrients, and it's going to reduce the need for chemical fertilizer and will improve our soil, okay, and which will actually a healthy plant will then also reduce pests and various diseases. And as we know, right, compost saves water. Okay, that's one of the most important things. We're talking about water-wise backyard gardening, so compost, definitely. Talk a little bit about some planting techniques, very briefly, um, that will help us uh, save um, water, okay? The seeds, transplanting, and in-bed spacing, right? So when, very often when we're first starting to grow, we tend to want to plant the seeds directly into the soil. I know I did this when I was 12, right? I was very disappointed that the carrots did not grow, the carrot seed did not grow very well in clay soil. Um, you know, that was one of the, the biggest disappointments um, early on. Um, if we propagate our seeds in small containers ahead of time, so in the early spring, we will actually reduce the amount of water that we use versus putting rows and rows of seeds and then having to water the entire bed. So this is a water, a water saving technique. Okay? It also imp will improve our germination rate. Okay? If you've planted seeds in the ground before, and noticed that you have this sort of irregular spacing. There'll be like one inch has nothing, and then the next inch has four plants. This is kind of frustrating because we, we see that the garden bed is being waste or wasted, or we end up having to thin out. Uh, this, by planting your own seeds and propagating your own seedlings, and not only does this save water, but it actually helps with the frustration of the sort of uneven planting that often happens in our garden beds. Okay. Loretta, your audio is going a little uh, in and out. One um, of the other things that's, that's really beneficial for planting and for creating. Oh, I'm sorry. Hmm. Um, maybe okay. if you turn How's your that? your video, maybe Can if you, you turn me? your your. We hear no. you. We hear you. But maybe if you turn your video off, you'll have a a um okay. a better connection. Turn my video off. Okay. Um, at the bottom, if you just stop your video, you might we might it might help your internet connection. Okay. Is that better? Yeah. Why don't we try that? I mean, we've been able to hear you. It's just gone a little in and out. Okay. Okay. All right. Okay, that seems better. Okay. Is that better? Okay. Yeah. So let me know if we're having problems. Okay. Um, one of the things that I wanted to also say, uh, propagating your own seeds rather than, um, say, for instance, purchasing um, uh, trans, uh, uh, purchasing seed actually have complete control of your planting schedule, which is great, right? And very often you'll have healthier seedlings, and my and it's obviously it's very satisfying as well. When we're transplanting, our trans our seedlings are ready to transplant in the garden when we have two true leaves, and when our plants are somewhere between two and three inches tall. The timing of transplanting is very, very important. We want to transplant during the cool part of the day. I, especially in the Milpitas and the Sunnyvale area, I would recommend transplanting at the end of the day. Sometimes if we get up, however, um, if it's a warm day, our little newly planted transplants will have to endure uh, in the evening uh, as it's a little bit cooler, our transplants will have um, a, some time to acclimate to the new environment and not have um, not be subjected to so much sun. Okay. One of the one of the um, most important things about transplanting is to make sure that our soil is moist. One of the things that we very often see when we're first starting to grow is that um, we we transplant into soil that is not um, uh, moist enough. So we don't want to transplant into dry soil, okay? So the soil that we transplant into should have the same moisture as the soil that the plant is in, in, in terms of the, in the pot or the flat that we're taking it from. 
in-bed spacing is, a, is a, an important um, aspect to efficient gardening and also can help us with our uh, water usage as well. Vegetables have different spacing requirements. Okay, so um, a beet has different spacing than a pumpkin, for instance. Okay, um, it depends on how big they get, how big their root system, know the proper spacing of crops. Right, spacing uh, for, the, for the vegetables that you want to grow on the back of your seed packet, so it will tell you. Also, too, the seed companies uh, will produce information that will give that as well. So, for instance, oh, beets, you can sow them as close as three to four inches. The pumpkins are going to need 30 to 36 inches, and then there's all different kinds of uh, spacing in between. I like to talk about the idea of a hexagonal spacing method. When we're transplanting, if we plant in rows, it's nice and tidy, okay? Um, but the plants are not evenly spaced from one another. If we use a hexagonal spacing method, what we can do is we will be able to, I don't know if you guys can see this, the distance from each of these plants is going to be equal. Right? And what we have with this planting method uh, is, is um, it's going to allow each plant for optimal, optimal root um, growth, right, and obviously foliage growth as well. When this, when the, the the plants grow up, they will naturally create their own soil shade. It's almost like a living mulch. Again, this will help with the weeds, right? That's always a topic. But then it will also help shade the soil and prevent a, a soil evaporation. So another great way that we can utilize planting techniques to save water. Okay, so let's talk a little bit about watering since this is more or less the topic of the evening. Uh, I'll, I am the first one to admit that I'm a very, very low tech gardener. And I, um, I have a love hate relationship with drip irrigation. So that is my bias and I'll be right up front with it. <laughs> However, um, there um, obviously drip irrigation is a very, very efficient way to, to irrigate. So when you're um, considering your, your watering plan, um, we wanna make sure that we um, uh, understand that keeping the soil moist is gonna be essential to maintaining the plant life and the soil life itself. And if we think of, when we think of watering, if we're thinking of keeping the soil alive, um, not necessarily the plants. So, uh, um, which is an interesting concept because most of us think, well, if I just water right at the stem of the plant, then that should do it. But it's actually the soil and the root systems below that we wanna make sure have enough water. So choosing our water strategy is gonna depend on the size of your garden. Right, the types of garden beds you have, the time and the abilities of the gardener. We always like to make sure that our water, that we're actually watering enough, right, and avoiding watering too much. And the best way to do that is to check the soil. After you water, about 30 minutes later, right, maybe an hour later, you want to check the, the moisture of the soil. Get in there with your little trowel or your hand and dig down about four or six inches. Pull up that soil. Make sure that, right, if it's crumbly or if it's clearly dry, we haven't watered enough. So if our in-ground beds and our raised beds are going to be easily fitted to drip irrigation. The pots in the small gardens, are, the small containers, um, are usually are going to be better off uh, watered um, by hand and consider using both methods. Now, like I said, we use both methods um, at, the, at Pacifica Gardens. We have our drip irrigation go on in the morning uh, so that we can pull the water down and, and have minimal evaporation. And in the afternoons, we have a watering team that comes in and checks each of the beds and, um, and then we'll water additionally if necessary. Pan watering will allow for even watering. All right, so we have an opportunity to make sure that the bed is evenly watered and the gardener can easily adjust to the water, uh, um, the amount of water that the bed needs or that the plant needs. And if it's a sunny day one day and a foggy day the next, you can immediately um, uh, make that change in the amount of, of water that you use. Some disadvantages are if you get sloppy, right, we end up with watering the edges too much or the outside of the bed. We do have the potential for shallow root growth, 
So we wanna make sure that when we are hand watering that we do check and make sure that we're watering sufficiently. And of course, um, water evaporation um, is a potential um, downside to hand watering. I always recommend that people use hand watering nozzles and wands that allow um, a, a control and direction of the water stream. These little things on the right here are my favorite ones, especially the one that was given to me by the Pacifica Water District. Um, it's a, um, all of these have the ability to change the nozzle so that we can find the nozzle that is appropriate for not only the plants, right, but the area that we're watering. The best time to water if you're hand watering is the end of the day, right, about three hours before sunset. Now in Milpitas and Sunnyvale, this is usually not a problem, right? We have long days right now. Um, watering at the end of the day will help reduce evaporation and save water. Um, the late uh, um, afternoon watering still allows enough time for the leaves to dry before sunset, okay? So on the coast side, we have to be careful on a foggy day watering late in the afternoon. Sometimes our leaves will not dry in time. So we have to, we have to watch that. But for the sunnier climates um, in the East Bay and the South Bay, um, watering in the afternoon is gonna be your best option. We wanna make sure that for hand watering that we avoid strong streams of water that are directly plant, uh, that are directly applied to the plants and soil. We will cause erosion. You don't want to disrupt the plants and the root system. And of course it will waste water. Um, as much fun as it can be to uh, spray down your paths, um, yeah, don't, okay? Avoid watering your paths, patios, and your decks. Drip irrigation um, is um, a very, very efficient way to water your garden. We'll notice that our, <coughs> um, um, that takes quite a bit less time uh, to water your garden. You can walk away from it, right? It does save water and um, by minimizing evaporation. The best time to use your drip irrigation system is either in the early in the morning or at the end of the day. Again, we're looking at um, uh, minimizing water evaporation. Drip irrigation is, um, and I should say also two soaker hoses uh, will promote um, a deep watering of the plants, which is gonna increase the depth of the root system. Okay, and it also allows your garden, it allows you to water your garden when you're not at home. So I just wanna mention if you can hear all that howling um, and on the coast side here, we have the eight o'clock howl. We've had it since uh, the very beginning of shelter in place and my apologies if it's disrupting. <laughs> Drip irrigation does have some disadvantages aside from the fact that it's of, a, of its expense, right? Um, it does make the hex in bed transplanting a little bit more challenging. Um, I'm constantly repairing leaks and um, in, in the big garden, so it's a little bit annoying. Um, but um, uh, again, it, it, it does help us with efficiency. Occasionally, depending on the plants, um, we can have uneven watering. If the little emitters are just not placed in the right place. Sometimes we'll have some that will get water very well and others will not. Okay, so um, let's talk about some crops that, um, uh, the, especially crops for soil protection and sustainability. Unfortunately, we don't have plants that you would put in your garden bed. Um, we, we just don't have time. <laughs> um, but I just want to make a couple of suggestions for planting uh, veggies for year-round uh, harvest. Um, the, uh, on, in Milpitas and the East Bay in the warmer climates, we, are, we clearly have two seasons. We have the warm weather season and we have the cool weather season. So for our warm weather season, we'll plant those during the main growing season. So that will be at, you know, between April and probably the beginning of September. So the warm weather crops are gonna be your tomatoes and your peppers and your beans and your squash and your pumpkins and your potatoes, the things that we traditionally think of as warm weather, warm weather crops. And we can also plant root crops. The root crops are beets and our carrots and radishes, those things that we're gonna grow into the soil. If you plant those in succession, so know how long they're gonna to take to maturity, you can plant three or four rows of carrots, wait a couple weeks, plant another three or four rows of carrots, 
wait a couple weeks, what we'll have is you'll have a successive planting where you'll have mature carrots throughout your season or mature radishes or mature uh, beets. Our leaf crops, right, are, and our cool weather crops, right, um, are great for the fall. So the leaf, some of the leaf crops for the warmer climates like lettuce and spinach and chard will do better in the cool climate. So the, at the end of the season or at the very, very beginning. Unless you have shade nets and a, an elaborate way to protect your delicate leaves, um, uh, usually that hot climate is not going to be um, uh, you know, beneficial for the, for the leaf crops. The cool weather crops, you can plant those in, in the fall. So those are going to be your cabbages, your broccoli, all the brassica, the, the fam, the brassica family. Again, your spinaches, the beet family, right, can all be planted um, in the fall. So you end up now, if you want, um, a, a garden that can produce vegetables for you year round. So at the end of the growing season, any bed right, that does not have a cool weather crop or an overwintered crop Right, should be planted with a cover crop. So this bed on the right here is one of our beds at Pacifica Gardens. We have a multi-species cover crop planted in there. Right, and this um, uh, cover crop is going to protect and improve the soil. So again, remember earlier we were talking about how we probably shouldn't uh, leave the bed open, right? Leave it vacant, leave the soil bare. When we're finished growing, we want to plant a cover crop. Okay, and that can be a combination of legumes which are going to help with nitrogen, um, also biomass, and then we can also have some grains in there as well. In the late winter or the early spring, right, uh, you can cut the cover crop down. You can just drop it on the bed if you want and let it further decompose until the, until the spring, or you can incorporate it into your compost piles. When we're looking at this idea of sustainability, and if you're making your own compost, you, want to, you might want to consider planting crops that are going to be specifically used as, quote, compost crops, okay? So crops like sunflowers, corn, if you have the space, fava beans and other legumes, uh, I can already mentioned the cover crop mixes, and grains are all plants that can help the stalks to the grains and the sunflower stalks and the corn stalks all add great carbon to your compost, your, um, your compost piles. And um, because you live in an area where there are lots of deciduous trees and they'll have maple leaves uh, dropping in the streets, um, you can use those as well. And also to consider crops that are gonna attract pollinators. That's another way in which we can create a healthier garden that has fewer pests um, create, um, plant um, plants that will attract our pollinators and create habitat for our beneficial insects. And I think the last thing that I want to say is most importantly we need to have fun. It's, um, it's wonderful to see this surge in people being interested in planting backyard gardens. It gives us an opportunity to be with our families. It, be, it gives us an opportunity to learn. It gives us an opportunity to um, create a little bit of food security for ourselves and, um, and sort of an understanding and reconnecting um, with um, the soil. So with that, I am finished and... Great, we have questions. Okay. Um, so first of all, I do want to recognize that it is 8.10, so if okay. you are um, on the call and you're not able to stay on longer, thank you for joining us, but please stay on the call. We're at our happy to answer questions. Um, so going after what you just talked about cover crops, yes. Carol would like to ask that she has fava beans and she wants to know when to cut them up and if she should put them back into the earth and like timing of kind of when to, to cut up the cover crop. And is it okay. when they have beans on them? Okay, so fava, fava beans are terrific um, in oh so many ways. We consider the fava bean to be like this ideal compost crop. When we are looking to grow nitrogen into our soil, we, um, um, we need to make sure that we remove this, the plant stalks when they are about 
10 to 15% flowered when there are no beans on there. If you have the opportunity to pull up an entire fava plant and look at the root system, you'll see that there's going to be little nodules on the root system. If those if that root system has like a little pink tinge to it, you know that you're fixing nitrogen. The, um, the fava beans and some of the other um, peas and some of the other beans that you can grow, they're all nitrogen fixers. It's important to understand that they're that before they have beans, they're literally, it's free nitrogen, right, going into the soil. Once the plant begins to make beans, it now is taking that nitrogen back up into the rootstock. So any gains that you've made, right, by nitrogen fixing into your soil will be lost. So optimally, what you want to do if you're growing your fava beans for your for the soil or for your compost, you want to cut them down when they're about 10 to 15 percent flowered. Right? So the fava bean flower is usually a lovely white flower with a deep, uh, a deep purple uh, um, uh, you know, center. The, it will attract um, all kinds of bumblebees and everything. It's just great. It's a, it's, it's a wonderful plant. But if you're looking to maximize your nitrogen fixing in your soil, cut them down early. Now, if you do like me accidentally, like, oh, gee, I didn't get out there and get it harvested enough and, and harvested in time, and you're going to take it down anyway, take the whole bean and, and everything, right, and you can put that in your compost, um, uh, um, your compost bin as well, um, chop it up a little bit, and, um, and eat the beans, okay? So you've, um, you haven't optimized your nitrogen fixing into your soil at that, time, at that point, but you have grown a very valuable compost crop and you've created food for yourself. Does that, hopefully that helps. <laughs> yeah, we have another question on cover crops. Um, we have a question on, in like the yeah. South Bay, Mountain View, Sunnyville, Milpitas area, if there's other cover crops you suggest to use in the summertime. Yeah, so um, uh, in, the, in, in the summer, if you're growing cover crop in the summertime, you can get um, mixes, if you will, um, cover crop mixes that will have, um, uh, that will have um, uh, some kind of peas, biomass peas. Also, they very often have grains. Uh, that will that grow well in the summer um, um, in this in the summer months and so things like uh, uh, wheat and rye and barley and all of those can be incorporated in your cover crop mix the advantage to the growing the grains during the summer is that the grains have a very, very bring carbon into your soil during those times when it, when it's um, when the plants are growing. So those are those are great. Um, other things that that do very well in the sunnier climates um, are going to be um, buckwheat. Um, it, it sounds kind of crazy, but it's a it's a great cover crop. Uh, it also will help attract beneficial uh, insects, and um, uh, and then all and it. It too um, creates a lot of biomass for the the compost. I'm trying to think of others that will do well. Um, off the top of my head, vetch does well. Um, Austrian peas do well. Uh, there's um, the smaller um, um, uh, bell beans, which is a, a a type of fava bean, will also do well in the summer. Um, there, I order a lot of my uh, seed from Peace of Valley Farm Supply. They have, uh, they have cover crop mixes the, and uh, for warm weather cl climates and cool weather climates. So you might want to go there and see what they recommend. Hopefully that Great. Mm -hmm. um, I just want to make one note that when Laura and I did mention the spray nozzle Hose, um, Milpitas residents, we do offer water conservation kits, which include these. And um, check savewatermilpitas.org for dates that we'll be giving them out at City Hall. On the water side, we have if we, a question about using a soaker hose to water a raised bed. Yes. Um, so um, your the the soaker hoses um, are are sort of kind of like between 
um, a watering by hand and having a drip irrigation system. The soaker hose, you still have to turn it on and turn it off. Um, but um, uh, using the soaker hoses is a way that you can um, deep water uh, your garden bed in a similar way uh, to um, uh, the drip irrigation where you'll place the hoses um, on the bed and, um, and it's obviously attached to, um, uh, to your regular hose, you'll turn it on and, and the water just sort of leaks out, if you will, uh, into the soil. So it's, uh, uh, it's a way in which um, we avoid evaporation, we avoid erosion, and you can sort of set a timer um, and walk away for a while and, and then come back. It's kind of you know in between the time drip irrigation system and doing hand watering. I hope that helps. <laughs> Thank you, Pat Moretta. More in here. Uh, someone's wondering what the minimum height of a raised bed would be. Oh, great! I'm so glad you asked that. I um I I, I took out like 15 slides on the raised bed construction because um, I knew we didn't have three hours like we usually have. So I'm so glad somebody asked me about that. So the the just when you're making a raised bed take into consideration the taller the bed the more soil you need obviously to fill it and it's an interesting math problem um, so take that into consideration we have our beds in at pacifica gardens they're 18 inches high and so um and the reason they're 18 inches high is because gophers uh, can climb into a 12 foot bed and I'm a 12 inch bed. So I, I usually tell people that um, a little bit higher than 12 inches, if you have a gophers, I'm not sure, I don't remember, um, you know, the prevalence of gophers and moles in Sunnyvale and Milpitas, but if this is an issue that you have, look at that, at getting that bed a little bit taller than, than 12 inches. Um, and um, uh, any bed that's only six inches, it, you kind of start losing the advantages of having a raised bed. Um, other than you have a well-defined bed borders and that type of a thing, but gophers will jump into a, um, a, a six inch bed quite easily. I've seen it happen. Um, and uh, so you want to um, avoid that. Now that said, uh, we also have a few beds that are what we call ADA compliant. So they are, they meet the standards for the American with Disabilities Act. So th those beds are uh, gonna be 30 inches high. And so once you get a bed that tall, you're looking at a lot of soil. Um, and then also to the taller the bed, the less water wise it's going to be, it starts turning into a large container. Um, so that's why um, I recommend, you know, keeping, um, getting those, the optimal bed height to be, you know, somewhere between 15 and 18 inches. Great, thank you so much. Uh, mm -hmm. Another question. If you have used Roundup prior to deciding to grow a garden, what would you recommend for a type of bed or insulation from the contaminated ground? Um, so, Good question. Um, so if somebody has used uh, used the Roundup, um, it will, uh, well, it, it does dissipate um, after a while. Um, um, if, if this was my situation, what I would do immediately is I would try to clear out any debris, obviously, that had been uh, sprayed. And, um, and I would get um, some really good living organic compost put that in there and then I would grow um, cover crop. Just gr grow, the cro grow the cover crop and that will help dissipate it. Um, and um, there are other um, plants also, some flowers um, that can help with um, remediation as well. I am not a soil remediation expert by any stretch, but those are the things that I have done. Great. We have a question about composting. Someone's wondering if they should mix their old redwood tree leaves with other types of things. Okay, so um, redwood, um, the um, redwood is will tend to acidify your compost. Now, depending on what, if you're growing blueberries. Um, then, then that should be fine. I usually try to keep um, all of the, um, the redwood and the pine and all of that out of, um, out of my compost. 
the things that I put in my compost for my, my veggie garden uh, include my, my kitchen scraps and um, the things that I grow in my garden specifically for compost, um, my fava beans and my sunflowers. And, um, and then the crop residue uh, from the crops that I grow and of course then my cover crop. So if you um, uh, can not put that in your compost, your compost will probably um, um, be better off. Um, that said, um, many, um, many um, uh, planting soils have redwood um, components to it. You just need to be aware that it may um, uh, increase the acidity of, the, of your compost. Very helpful. Great. So I'm just wondering, do cover crops like buckwheat or clover require a lot of water? Um, actually, once you get them planted, no. <laughs> um, yeah, clo uh, I forgot about clover. Yeah, it's a great. Uh, yeah, it's a great thing. Um, uh, actually, um, no. Um, it, um, if you um, uh, you will have to water them. Um, if you're putting them in a bed, you you can actually use your irrigation uh, drip irrigation system quite easily um, and, and to minimize your overhead water. Um, the important thing about the cover crop is that it is performing a valuable function for your soil and ultimately will help with water conservation. Great. And we kind of have a question about steer manure. Um, someone asked, can we add steer manure to, to soil for vegetable gardening? And then someone also asked, can we use steer manure and chicken manure? Right. Okay. So manures in your, um, the answer is yes, um, but w with a couple of caveats. I, um, I avoid using manures as much as possible. It's a personal choice for me. Um, and, um, and yet manures have been a, um, you know, a part of um, organic gar backyard gardening for millennia. So um, that said, if you're going to use a manure, make sure that you put it through your composting system. What does that mean? Um, so um, uh, if you're making your regular compost and, you know, say you have access to chicken manure, your neighbor has a bunch of chickens and they, they say, Can, do you want this chicken, uh, you want this uh, um, manure? Take some of that and put that and put that through your, through your compost, um, uh, your compost system. That way it will, um, uh, uh, manures are very, very high in nitrogen. If they are not aged properly, if they are not fully composted, uh, they, um, they can actually burn your uh, vegetables uh, and, um, and, and damage your vegetables. The other thing that they do is they put so much nitrogen, they can put so much nitrogen into the garden bed that your plants are just like, you get like jack and the beanstalk type um, uh, plants. And then they become very, very disease prone. It's a very strange thing when you get too much nitrogen. So the answer is yes, you can use the steer manure, you can use the chicken manure, but I strongly recommend that you compost it, put it through your composting system. Um, and or make sure that it is well aged or actually fully composted. Great, thank you. We have a question about mulch. Someone yeah. asked, mm -hmm. what is mulch? What chips? And then someone asked, what do you recommend as mulch on your veggie bank beds? Okay. So mulches are basically anything that you're going to put on the soil surface that its purpose primarily is to um, uh, prevent water evaporation. Now, many mulches will also then decompose and then become part of the, the soil system, right? Is eventually, essentially what you're having is composting in place. So chips are um, a terrific um, thing to use as, as mulch. I don't recommend them for the garden beds themselves. Again, you're looking at something that is going to um, uh, increase the acidity of the area over time. Um, uh, that said, you know, Pacifica Gardens Orchard uh, is chipped. Uh, we, we chip it on a regular basis. But the other mulches for, the, for your garden bed um, can include straw. If you're, um, if you're in your area, you'll also have leaves too. So you can mulch with leaves. Say over, I know it sounds silly, but over here on the coast side, we don't really have very many deciduous trees. They don't grow very well here. So no one has a maple. Um, and uh, um, so a maple tree, but you all have those. And so you can, you can use those for mulch and I would recommend using those. 
the thing you want to be aware of when you're mulching your your um your garden bed is that depending on um your slug and snail okay situation sometimes the mulch turns out to be a little bit of a, an attractant for the the snails and slugs so you might have to kind of watch and see maybe take the mulch off um, or go out there in the in the evening um, pull it off you know in, at night so that the little darn little things don't um, get underneath there um, but so slugs and snails like to ha hide out in mulch um, we use straw we use right organic rice straw for mulch for our potato beds uh, they make uh, they make great um, great mulch as well for the container beds honestly I like pebbles um the little um you know little pebbles on my around in my herbs um, helps hold the water in my pots and um and add a little bit of warmth as well so those are some ideas um i um i don't well i've never really actually used a purchased mulch so i'm i'm usually using something that i can find either straw or chips um Let's see what else. Um, if I think of something, I'll, I'll come back to it. <laughs> Hopefully that's helpful. Yeah, that's great. And going off of that, someone asked if you have any recommendations for slug and snail control. Ah, slug and snail control. Yes. Um, um, aside from screening. Um, so sl slug and snail, in my own garden, what I use, uh, I save my eggshells and I um, wash them, I dry them, and I crumple them up. Not, I don't grind them, I just crumple them up. And they're little shards of shell, and I place those around my, um, my new plantings. Slugs and snails do not like to walk over them. It's uncomfortable. So uh, it's a deterrent. So it's, a, it's an organic deterrent. No one gets hurt, mostly, except for perhaps maybe the little foot of the, of the slug. Um, and uh, um, it's, a, it's a great way to, uh, to keep them um, away. The thing about using the eggshells is that if you do have a, um, a, a slug problem, um, you're gonna need to reapply. And you'll need to reapply, you know, every a week or whatever, or every other week. Just keep saving your eggshells, and you can use them. You can use them um, throughout the summer. The other thing that's a good barrier is copper. Now, copper strips. You can buy copper strips for your garden beds in rolls. It is a little on the pricey side, but again, uh, you create a something that the little slugs and the snails do not like to walk over. Um, for some reason, copper is, you know, they just have an aversion to it. They won't walk over it. If neither of those work, what you'll need to do is go out in the evening and open, like take a flashlight and look and literally pick the slugs and snails out of your garden, out of your garden beds. Once you do that a couple of times, um, you'll actually diminish the um, uh, the uh, the slugs and snails. So um, I remember when I was first gardening here on the coast side. I wow, you know, I was out there at ten o'clock at night with my flashlight, um, and um, we were picking slugs and snails, uh, mostly slugs, out of our garden beds, and we just put them in water, and then you know, composted their little bodies later. Um, so that's those are the organic ways to do it. There are uh, some um, relatively safe uh, um, 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 organic or armory listed uh, pesticides that you can use. Sluggo is a brand name that, that can be used. Uh, if you do use that, it's supposed to be safe for, for pets and children, but I, um, I really only use it um, if I absolutely need it and don't use it too often. Hopefully that helps. Great, okay, on a different note, how would one design an approach to drip irrigation that takes into account the different water needs of different crops that might be grown in a raised bed? Yes, good question. So this is my this this is my love hate relationship with uh, drip irrigation. So um, what you can do is um, uh, when you design when you design your drip irrigation, you can design it so each of your beds has its own separate timer. All right, and um, and this way you'll be able to uh, set each timer right according to the needs of that bed. So, for instance, I have four four by eight garden beds in my backyard. I could easily create my system where each of my four beds has its own timer. 
Now these little timers are not that expensive. And, um, and so if you do create a system like that, you, you can do that. Um, if you have one system where the system goes on and it goes on for 10 minutes and you have no way of controlling it and the amount of water that goes, this is an issue. And for us at the big garden, that is the one reason why we've implemented both drip irrigation and hand watering. If you have separate timers um, for each of, of the beds, you can set the, the amount of time for that bed. So for instance, you know, you have zucchini for, you know, in, in one bed and they're, you know, planted 18 inches apart. Well, you can easily create that bed um, and, and, and meet the water needs for your zucchini by, uh, by wrapping the, you know, encircling each of the plants with, with, the, uh, the, with the drip line, making sure that all the emitters are, you know, are working, um, you know, for, that, for, for the plants. Um, now, there may be more sophisticated ways to do it, but that is the best way that I know how to do it, um, to, to, to design it, to making sure that you can control the water with each of your beds. I think that helps. Great. And these questions kind of go hand in hand. Someone asked, how would you keep cats out from adding fertilizer to the garden? chicken wire fencing. And then someone also asked, what about squirrels digging up the beds or eating fruits? Yeah, okay. So the four-legged, the four-legged that like to come visit are um, um, somewhat um, a problematic uh, in, indeed. Um, now, usually the cats, once the bed is planted, um, uh, I've have several cats in our neighborhood that will come and visit us periodically. But once my bed is planted, they usually don't come and dig in. Um, you know, um, you, um, it's really difficult to keep a cat out. Um, even if you build little fences around your beds, which I have done sometimes, um, you know, they, they will just jump in anyway. Um, but that's certainly a possibility is to, is to make little, um, little, fences, if you will, around the, um, um, around the garden bed. I have dogs and I have had dogs for 20 years. So my dogs um, maintain the cat environment by making sure that the cats don't. So, um, you know, that, that, that's, that's one way. Um, I don't, there might be some cat deterrent um, type things. Um, I would suggest um, you plant some catnip um, somewhere else and the cats will have tend to go toward the catnip rather than into your bed. That's a possibility as well. Um, the squirrels. Uh, the only way I know to keep a squirrel out of a garden bed is to actually create a, um, a sort of like a netting situation. You can do this. Um, it's a little bit of a, of a job, but um, for squirrels and birds, there is um, a bird friendly, squirrel friendly type netting that you can create. You have to build a little structure and cover your bed with it. Um, those are the easiest ways that I know right off bat. Um, let me think of what I don't have squirrels, so I don't, I'm, I'm not, uh, oh, I know. Now, this is. <clears throat> um, at the garden, we have put, uh, we have had problems with uh, big birds, um, as in a murder of crows almost took out an entire um, uh, pear crop a couple of years ago. You can get some of these little noisemakers. They are um, motion sensitive um, screeching sounds, and you can set them uh, to deter squirrels and the birds. They do work. Uh, however, I would caution people, it is sort of noise pollution. Um, if you um, use them uh, sparingly and intermittently, you can probably control the, um, the, the winged um, visitors as well as the squirrels uh, without disrupting your neighborhood too much. Okay, anything else? Also, someone asked specifically about rats eating tomatoes. Would you recommend the same approaches for rats? Oh, rats. Um, yeah. <laughs> um, hmm. 
Now, other than trapping them, um, I, um, I don't know of another way. Um, and, and that's an unfortunate thing because you're having to set um, uh, rat traps. Um, you can, again, you can try to create little um, barriers. Um, one, one option might be to use a, um, when for the tomatoes, perhaps maybe create a little cylinder, if you will, of that half inch galvanized uh, wire and, and sort of just set it over, that may help. Um, the, obviously the long-term issue is um, dealing with where the rats are coming from, et, et cetera. Um, uh, they can be a, a little on the problematic side, but I would try to create um, the barriers as well. You can, like I'm just thinking that um, you could do that with a half inch galvanized wire. I don't know that the chicken wire would work because again, you know, little rats could squeeze in. Uh, hopefully that helps. <laughs> yeah, definitely. Um, okay, we have a question about cover crops. So mm -hmm. are colorides, mustard greens considered cover crops, also kohlrabi or just cold weather crop? Oh, got it, okay. Yeah, yeah sorry. So the, yeah, no. Um, the cool the cool weather crops are usually the crops that will obviously do well in cool weather, and they're going to encompass a, um, several um, uh, types of plants. So the the um, the the um, the crops that we normally consider part of the brassica family, the quote coal crops, that will be your cabbages and your kales, collards, uh, broccoli. Um, arugula, those are all um, part of the brassica family and they are all cool weather crops. Um, and um, the um, cover, are we, are we just making a distinction between cover crops and cool weather crops? Or, yes. yeah, so okay, got it. Um, so, cover crops themselves, um, those are any crops that we're going to plant in our bed for the specific purpose of enhancing the soil. Um, or creating materials for our compost, uh, our compost bins, or um, as we're as we're creating in our in our own backyards. So the cover crops will usually come in, sort of like you can order, you can get cover crop mixes, um, and um, that are um, that grow well in warm weather climates or cool weather climates. I think that's probably where we got the, the mixed up cool um, weather crops and cool weather cover crops. There, we make a distinction between those. With the cover crops, um, the cover, especially the cover crop mixes, they'll have the combination of a legume. So a legume would be some type of a bean that will be nitrogen fixing. And then there will also be some grains that will help with soil, um, um, actually soil improvement by growing the root systems into the ground. So hopefully that helps. So the cool weather crops that we're talking about are those crops that do well in cool climates or cooler times of the years. So for Sunnyvale and Milpitas, you're gonna be waiting until late August, probably early September, or even maybe a little bit later. And that's when you'll be able to plant your cabbages, your kale, your collard greens, your broccoli. Um, so that, you know, and there might also be, um, you know, and you'll, you can do that in a couple of your beds and maybe you're not gonna plant all of your beds in, in uh, your cool weather crops or your overwintered crops in, take the other beds and then put a cover crop in those. I hope that makes a, the distinction a little bit easier. Great, and we have a question about compost. So someone asked, how do I compost oak leaves fast? And how sh hot should your compost pile get? And what's too hot? Okay, <laughs> what's too, and what is too hot? Okay, so um, uh, uh, oak leaves. Okay, so um, oak leaves are great. Um, so if you want to compost your oak leaves, you're gonna need, um, I mean, if you want to try the, the fastest, 
uh, way to um, compost is to, you know, once you build your pile, I don't know if the, the person who's asking has experience uh, composting or not, um, but your, your basic um, uh, way to build a compost pile is going to be layering the high nitrogen um, ingredients, uh, for instance, like the, the fresh grass clippings, the uh, crop, um, the crop residue from your garden, your kitchen scraps, you're going to be layering that with the, with the dried oak leaves. So you'll layer, 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 and if you have a compost pile already going, then you can inoculate it with a little bit of that compost, and that will sort of help bring in some of the, um, of the living biology. And then you're going to water it. Okay, so as you as you water, um, in, within about two or three days, you should get it. It should be up right around 120 to 130 degrees. Um, and and then once you get it there, right, you can you can turn it. 150 degrees is too hot. Okay, um, and we um, we look at this idea of. Once it gets too hot, we destroy the, um, the little microbes in there. So you can buy a compost, um, a, a compost thermometer where you can actually see what type of activity you have. If the fastest way is, um, is to get the temperature up to somewhere between 130 and maybe 140 have that for a couple of days. As soon as it drops, the temperature drops down, you're going to turn it. It will speed up again, right? And I mean, it will heat up again, and then you can turn it again. So you'll probably turn it a couple of times um, for a couple of weeks, like every couple of weeks, and then, um, and then you'll let it sit, right? And then it, it will probably still take, um, um, you know, um, a, a good couple of months in order to compost them. That said, I, I saw a permaculture expert many years ago make um, hot compost pile um, and he had compost in less than a month. Um, but that involved really monitoring it and as soon as it dropped down, turning it and then letting, getting it um, uh, heat up again. Hopefully that helps. <laughs> Oak leaves, I'm so jealous. <laughs> Um, before we were talking about mulch, someone asked, is colored wood chips okay to use as mulch? Yeah, I, I'm not a fan of um, ornamental uh, um, colored uh, wood chips for the, um, uh, for, for the vegetable garden. Unless you absolutely know what, how it got colored or what the coloring is. Um, I, I think that, um, you know, why take a chance? I don't, um, I, I'm, I, I don't trust that you won't have um, some toxic chemical seep into your, into your garden. That's just my recommendation. Uh, someone asked, where can we find what crops to plant during different seasons? Ah, so, um, where can you find that? Um, in the East Bay. Okay, so there are many, um, uh, the um, Rodale's Organic Gardening book has um, all kinds of um, uh, um, lists of, of crops. Um, there are um, John Jevons, um, How to Grow More Vegetables in Less Space Than You Ever Thought Imaginable. Um, has a very, very detailed planting chart and long list of, of uh, crops. Um, if the person who's asking the question wants me to rattle some off, right now I can. Um, let's see. Um, there are, just trying to think, organic, um, Rodale's Organic Gardening is a good one. Sunset also has um, um, some guidelines as well. But basically our uh, crops that are going to grow well in the warm weather are, you can, you guys can grow tomatoes of any kind. You can grow pretty much, yeah, you can grow tomatoes. You can grow all kinds of squashes. You can grow um, your summer squashes, so your zucchinis, your yellow squashes, your little patty pan squashes, 
Those all grow really, really well during the summer months. You can grow winter squashes, including pumpkins, including um, uh, uh, butternut squash, um, all the little the acorn squash, all those grow really well in your climate. Um, you can grow spaghetti squash. Those are all ideas that, you know, in terms of, in terms of squashes, right now is bean planting time. So if you want to plant beans, you can grow green beans, you can grow um, any kind of variety of green beans will grow in the, in the warm weather climates. You can grow pole beans. You can grow dry beans if you want to grow your own pinto beans or um, a bean that um, you want to dry and you know make for soup. You can grow those. Those all grow really well. You can grow kale at this time of year, but you need to find a cooler area for it and sometimes you'll need to shade it. Um, uh, the, um, the beet family, if you will, the beets will grow okay as long as you shade them a little bit. Um, Carrots will grow well uh, this time of year. Radishes will grow well this time of year. All kinds of herbs will grow this time of year. Um, let's see, what else did we ever plant? Potatoes will grow. Cucumbers, right? That, you guys, you guys can plant cucumbers. Any variety pr pretty much will grow well um, in your climate. Um, let's see, what else, what else, what else? Um, herbs. All kinds of herbs will grow well this time of year, especially cilantro, parsley. I'm just trying to like run through the, the big list. Melons, you can grow melons if you have the space. Um, so watermelon and cantaloupe, um, especially in Sunnyvale, Milfitas may be a little bit cooler. Um, you'll have, you have, you have the opportunity to grow um, any of those warm like peppers, peppers of all kinds, bell peppers, hot peppers, serranos. Um, um, let's see, what other kinds of peppers? Anaheim peppers, um, Thai chili peppers. You have lots and lots of, of, um, uh, of crops that are available to you. And what you might want to do is just go online and start looking at some of the online catalogs for uh, summer crops. So Johnny Seed Company, Territorial Seed Company, Peace with Valley Farm Supply, all of those seed companies will have um, um, vegetables that will grow well on, you know, well, grow well in the warmer climates. Hopefully that helps. <clears throat> Great. And going back to compost, um, <laughs> you get the worms when you compost, and can we mix the compost with dry eucalyptus leaves? Ah, okay, so, what's, so can you repeat the question about the worms? Yeah, someone just asked, where do you get the worms when you compost? Oh, um, I don't know, they just come. Okay. <laughs> um, <laughs> yeah, I mean, I, I, you know, um, so the, um, yes, they, they, um, they, they make their way. Um, you, if for some reason, you, you find that you don't, you know, have warm, get worms in your compost. Um, you can um, uh, buy worms. I haven't bought worms in like 30 years, so I actually couldn't even tell you um, where to buy them, but I'm pretty sure any reliable um, uh, gardening um, uh, store w w would have worms if you, if you need them. Um, from my perspective, you need to buy the red wigglers if you're going to start a, um, um, a worm bin. Um, other than that, um, for some reason, um, the, the worms just come. Um, if you have the right, if, you know, once your compost um, uh, has heated up a couple of times and it's cooled down and it just, and it just continues sort of on its you know, low temperature activity, the worms uh, will just show up. It's, it's, a, it's a magic and miracle of nature. <laughs> Was there another? Yeah, go ahead. Yeah, with the eucalyptus leaves. Did you oh, eucalyptus. That? Yes, I'm sorry, I forgot about that. Yes, you, you, yeah. Don't put eucalyptus into your uh, compost. Definitely not. <laughs> there are, um, yeah, that's definitely um, not something that um, uh, the the, the um, eucalyptus will be to is toxic. So um, try to keep those away. So the other leaves that are going to work really well. Uh, and for your compost are going to be your oak leaves and your um, um, your uh, maple leaves. 
um, many of the other deciduous trees that you have that are um, uh, low in acid um, can also be incorporated as well. I'm trying to even think, it's been so long since I've been acacia leaves. Those types of things will all will all do well. Great. Uh, a Hillsboro resident asks if you offer consulting design services. Uh, me personally, um, uh, uh, yes, I do. <laughs> if if anybody's interested. <laughs> Okay, and then another follow-up question. Um, is it possible to visit the Pacifica Garden? Absolutely. Oh, shoot. No, it's not. <laughs> God. Uh, we're, yeah, we're in pandemic um, right now. Um, yeah, so the garden is still closed. Um, uh, but um, ordinarily, absolutely. We have a website, um, pacifica-gardens.org. Um, um, we will post when, when the garden reopens, uh, we will be posting on that. And you can like us on Facebook and we'll let you, um, we'll let everybody know when the garden opens. We have a Saturday, we usually have Saturday work days where everybody or anybody who wants to come to the garden is welcome to. Uh, if you, you can bring your children um, and either just visit the garden or um, participate and, vol and, and volunteer doing something, help harvest, um, help weed, help dig. Um, we have all kinds of things that do that, that people can do. Um, but we're, I, I keep forgetting, we're still in pandemic mode here. Um, and uh, so the garden um, is currently closed, um, but um, absolutely we'd love to see anybody who wants to come visit it um, when we reopen. Darn. <laughs> Great. And do you know what the website is for the garden? Is it? Yeah, yeah, it's pacifica-gardens.org. Great, I'll include that in answering that question live. Okay. Um, and someone also asks, can I dissolve vitamin pill, for example, silver 50 plus in water, like a pill per gallon to water fruit trees or vegetables? Um, so the purpose of the vitamin C is to do, I'm, I, 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 I'll, I will all pl uh, claim ignorance here. Um, I've not, um, heard of that as a watering method. I'm assuming that is to reduce, um, of the pH. Um, but, um, um, yeah, I would, I, 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 I don't know, actually. I'm sorry. <laughs> no problem. Early on in the presentation, you repeat, you mentioned a name, I, John Jevons, was that correct? Yes. Okay. yes. Yeah, John Jevons from Ecology Action. John Jevons has been um, developing the um, uh, Grow Biointensive method for 50 years. And um, so he is the global authority on it. Uh, the website is Grow Biointensive dot org I think if anybody wants to take a look at the the, um, the biointensive system okay great and then this is kind of a comment but someone said my friend said if there's no tillage the bed is full of insects eating her plants do you mm -hmm. have any comments on that or yeah please? Yeah, uh, you know, I, I shared the same thing. I'm, you know, there are times when, you know, we're like, okay, we're trying not to disrupt the soil. And um, so sometimes when we're, uh, we're thinking we're going to go no till it's not quite, we're not quite ready yet to, uh, to do that. So um, if your garden bed is filled with insects that, you know, that and weeds that you don't want, then you're going to have to get them out of there. Um, so, um, you know, when we, when we talk about sort of no-till agriculture, you, you know, it's a, it's a broad, it's a spectrum, it's a continuum of everybody who's like growing a garden bed in their backyard versus, you know, you know, 200 acres or something like that of conventional uh, type agriculture. So, um, uh, we do know that uh, when we take our big tractors and we roll them down the acreage for, of the farms, you can just see the um, organic matter in the soil just like blowing up and the water evaporation and all kinds of things. So that's really what we're talking about when we say no-till. Um, but by the same token, 
um, when we, if we're digging all the time, if we are disrupting the soil structure that we, we, we work so hard to create. So we have added our compost, we've got living soil now, we've got bacteria and fungi, and we've got our earthworms in there, and they're, you know, they're producing this, you know, exudate that's sort of, you know, holding the soil together and creating this great structure. And I go in there with my fork and I disrupt it all. So, you know, there's going to be always going to be a certain amount of disruption when we do that, because we do have to like make a little hole for the plant when we put it in there. Um, but they, when, we're, when we're moving toward um, uh, no-till, what we want to do is we want to begin to minimally, minimally disrupt the soil. Um, if we have compaction, um, if we've had some sort of erosion, if our bed has gone fallow, so to speak, and has been uncovered for a season, uh, it's a little bit difficult to use a no-till kind of um, uh, operation at, at that particular point. So, um, you know, uh, I, I would say, you know, get in there, get the, you know, insects and the whatever's in there, the, the slugs and the snails and the weeds and everything, get out there and, uh, um, uh, you know, loosen up the soil a little bit, put some compost on there and plant it. And, and, and you'll be fine. I don't think that, you know, you, you, you'll be fine. <laughs> Great. And another question, will the weeds in my compost die? Ah, good question. Yes and no. Um, uh, this is a, uh, this is the uh, sort of the bane of existence for the uh, backyard uh, composter. If you have weeds <coughs> that um, have a seed head on them, don't put them in your compost pile. I speak from experience. And so you can put the, the stalks and the leaves of the weed, all right, in there, um, but I would remove the, uh, the seed head. So, um, and just put it in your, um, put it in your, um, your green waste bin and, um, and then it will be taken away by, you know, the, the waste company and it will be converted into compost at some point. And when it is, it will be heated up to such a height that, to such a degree that the weed seed will be killed. Our home composting systems generally will not, they won't. They won't get up to 180 degrees. And if they do, then you've killed all of your microorganisms in your compost pile. So um, that is something that you want to take into consideration. I mean, I personally love to put my weeds in my compost because that's extra green, um, um, sort of uh, immature greens for my compost. But if I get sloppy and I get lazy and I end up, you know, letting the, the uh, seed heads get, um, get in my compost, the stalks, of course, will decompose, but the weed seed um, uh, does not die. So just be careful <laughs> with, your, with your weed seed. Great, thanks so much, Loretta. So we actually don't have any more questions in the Q&A box. Oh, wow, okay. 47 <laughs> attendees, so I don't know if there's any last minute questions, if anybody would like to raise their hand and directly ask Loretta a question. Otherwise, I think we could wrap up. Okay, great. So, well, thank you, everybody. Um, uh, again, if you, um, uh, if you do have any questions um, and you uh, feel as though, you know, we want to have a conversation over email or whatever, you can happily um, email me at, um, um, at Pacific Gardens. Just uh, hit the general contact. It comes into my inbox. I'm happy to answer questions. And um, I wish you all um, the best of luck in your backyard gardening this summer. And I hope that you're able to have success and continue growing it even after the pandemic, um, because it, it's, a, um, it's, it's a wonderful lifelong um, uh, activity. So thank you again, um, everybody. And thanks to Bosca, and the city of Milpitas, and the city of Sunnyvale. Take care. Thank you so much, Loretta. Thank you everyone for joining us. This, this class will be, is being recorded and will be posted on the Bosco website. So keep an eye out for that. And yeah, we'll share um, the Pacifica Gardens email for that, to reach Loretta at and some of the other sites that were mentioned earlier. So thank you. Please join us for the future Bosco classes. And thank you everyone and have a good night.